Hello and welcome to Forgotten Fronts. In today's episode, we'll be playing the mission, Blocker's Knoll, in which we take Early's division to attack the 11th Corps. But first, the history. If you don't want to hear the history, a time will come up on your screen. Wait for it! Now! The death of Stonewall Jackson after the Battle of Chancellorsville led to a reorganization of the Confederate Army from two wings under Thomas Jackson and James Longstreet to three corps under A.P. Hill, James Longstreet, and Richard S. Ewell. Ewell served as a division commander under Jackson. Ewell was known to his men as Old Baldhead and served well with them. But at the Battle of Second Manassas, he was hit in the knee and his kneecap shattered, and he only recovered by the time of the Gettysburg Campaign. But by then, he was promoted to corps commander, a huge step up in his command. In the Gettysburg campaign, Ewell split his forces in two, sending half of them to York and the other half to Carlisle. And by June 26, Early's division entered Gettysburg, demanding a ransom of supplies after defeating an emergency militia. When Ewell received orders to concentrate his forces, he did so in Heidelberg, ten miles away from Gettysburg. Upon hearing that Hill was marching on Gettysburg, he followed by the Harrisburg Road, roughly at the same time that Heath and Rose were pushed back. Before Ewell's corps arrived, Barlow pushed his troops up to the only feature on the ground to push back dull skirmishers. He did this against orders, pushing forward the entire line and stretching it dangerously thin. This feature was a small knoll called Blocker's Knoll. When Ewell's corps arrived in the field, Early set up his four batteries of 12 guns under Hillary P. Jones on a hillside with good side of the knoll and began to bombard it. At the same time, John Brown Gordon's brigade aligned itself on Brigham's Lane with Harry Hayes, William Smith, and Isaac Avery just behind them. Gordon then advanced his brigade in the line, many of his men tired from a long march. As they advanced, they easily pushed back the four companies of the 17th Connecticut fortifying Benner Farm. With only 300 meters to go, Gordon ordered his troops to pick up the pace as much as the train would allow. Barlow's men didn't see this until it was too late, instead focusing their attention on Rhodes' division's attack. When Gordon's troops reached the Stony Creek, their formation was broken up, as the bank was so steep it could only be crossed at certain points. The crossing was also slowed by the waist-high water. As they arrived on the other side, the bank became more and more muddy, making it harder to climb, all the while they were being fired on by Union skirmishers. The crackle of rifle fire was like the fierce burning of dry undergrowth, which threw up great clouds of smoke in the distance as the troops of Early's division arrived on the field, the fifes and drums playing Dixieland as the troops marched down the road. It had been a long march from York, and many of the men were tired and needed water. The heat was locked in by the overcast clouds, their woolen uniforms not helping. The large clouds of dust, which helped to emphasize this, had long diminished as the men moved into their maneuver columns. Flags whipped in the wind as Jubal Early's staff looked over what was to be their front through their field glasses. Their concentration was quickly shattered when a galloping courier approached these battled men, handing him a dispatch from Ewell to attack the 11th Corps to his front. Upon reading his orders, Early exclaimed, these are the very same chaps that we our fellows thrashed and routed at Chancellorsville, and ordered Gordon's brigade of Georgians forward. forward! General Gordon gave us his ringing orders, forward right, shoulder arms. Here was a grand sight to see, the Federal infantry on the bank of the stream awaiting motionless our approach. Many a fellow on each side of that stream knew full well that in a few short moments they might be called across from life and their souls appear before the gods of battle. As soon as the men of Gordon's brigade clambered over the fences towards the Rock Creek, the men of Hayes' brigade received a courier ordering them to take their place in Brinkman's Lane. They were then ordered to be a close reserve of the men of Gordon's brigade. At the same time, the troops of Dole's brigade began to trade fire with the 2nd German rifles. The men bit into their paper cartridges, their mouths filling with the salty taste of gunpowder and staining the corners of their mouths black. The heat of the excitement and bursting powder increasing the already warm day to an almost unbearable temperature. The Confederates splashed their faces with water from the creek and wetted whatever rags they had, a luxury that the Dutch brigades did not have. Keeping their heads below the banks, the Confederates failed to put on brass percussion caps on their rifles as the mini balls cut through the air overhead. 
As the men of Dole's brigade crossed the rock creek, balls splattered in the muddy banks and water around them as the men raised their rifles and cartridge belts overhead to keep them out of the waist-high water. The attack thankfully drew the attention of Von Gleese's troops away from Gordon's imminent attack, the men of the brigade taking pot shots from the cover of the stream bank. One of the regiments attempted to flank through a nearby cornfield. At the same time, the regiments of Gordon's brigade crossed the farm field of the Benner farm, knocking aside the stalks as they marched through, their bayonets poking over the field like a silver wave. As Gordon's brigade continued to advance, the regiment of Dole's brigade advancing through the field came under heavy shell fire. A shell exploded among their ranks. A soldier had his stomach torn open by shrapnel, his intestines in his lap, thrashing and screaming among the corn stalks, spurting blood. Then another blasted the bloody wound of canister into their ranks, tearing the head off the body of another man. His head found a few feet from a still twitching body. Around the head was gray matter and a pool of blood, making sure to leave the most unholy harvest next season. Those men were left as the regiment charged the nearby fence post, kicking up dust to return fire on the gunners. The men's shoulders were soon bruised with the rifle kicks, and their faces blackened by blasting percussion caps. It was then on the other side of the field that Gordon's brigade passed the better farm, and Gordon removed his hat and trumpeted another order to his regimental commanders to attack, revealing their position to the several hundred shocked Dutch skirmish companies on the other side of the creek, who up until this point had their eyes trained on the attack of Dole's brigade on the flank of their formation. Now they sprung into action, readying their rifles to face the new foe about to cross the creek, vaulting over the fence of the nearby Benner farm, the officer at their head riding on a great black war horse with his hat in hand. Mein Gott, there are thousands of them! Private Wenzel, go to the general at once! We require support immediately! Oh. Private! Private Stahl, you must go now! We need support of moving! Oh. The columns of Confederate attackers stop briefly before forming into line, their officers barking out orders to attack various points along the creek. At the same time, the forces of Dole's brigade began to envelop the Dutch brigade's flank, and the second German rifles began to take withering fire, the companies forming small groups in the notches along the worm fence that are slowly torn to pieces by Confederate fire. The runners from the skirmishers finally reached the regiments that guarded his flank, and the large regiments began to wheel to face a new threat. The grey and butternut-clad attackers again stopped to fine-tune their orders before advancing once again, keeping their line as best they could, but halted to, at the steep creek beds looking for a way to descend into the awaiting water below. All the while, the large regiments uncoiled to unleash a devastating fire upon them. The Bartolite Infantry, the 60th and 26th Georgia, are finally ordered forth by Gordon to cross the creek. Rock Creek would have been a pleasant place in other circumstances, the trees along the creek providing pleasant shade while the creek brubbled along. The 31st Georgian was ordered to the left flank, mercifully spared the danger of the frontal assault, and so the regiment crossed back around the Benner Farm in a long grey column. They were soon joined by the right legion infantry. At the same time, the 60th Georgia advanced on the creek in narrow rivulets. Before they reached the water, the men slung their cartridge boxes over their rifles to keep them dry. The troops of the 153rd Pennsylvania and Schwartz Jaeger across the stream poured accurate fire on the advancing Georgians, resting their rifles on the nearby fence. 
Gordon then sent him courier to the 61st Georgia to move to support the flank of Dole's brigade. The 60th Georgia, in the meantime, had the shelter of the creek bed, but now the men had to struggle against the waist-high water of the creek, all the while the skirmishers picked away at their formation from the trees that lined it. However, the men of the 13th Georgia soon returned fire upon the skirmishers, driving them back, their mini balls cutting into the trees which they sheltered behind. Gordon micromanaged his attack, trying to avoid tangling them before they reached the creek, all the while shouting encouragements to his men. The men in the 31st Georgia nervously approached the bridge by the flank of the Dutch troops before their regimental commander ordered 4th Company A Georgia Light Infantry to scout out the bridge for an ambush. The next regiment to cross the creek was the 61st Georgia, moving to support the regiments of Dole's brigade. By now the creek was a sight from hell, the banks of the creek and the burbling stream reddened. The occasional body or part of a body was soon carried away in it. The fire of Dole's brigade soon became too much for the 2nd German rifles, who fled to the rear. The 31st Georgia advanced to the side of the bridge, their commander deciding it would expose them too much to the fire of the Yankees. In the meantime, the Rice Legion infantry reformed into a column and advanced at the double to the bridge. The large Pennsylvania regiment was so consumed by firing on the advancing Georgians that they allowed the 61st Georgia to move on their flank and fire in advance while rushing from tree to tree. The 61st was soon joined by the 28th Georgia, crossing the creek. Aim seeing this maneuver knew his brigade was soon to be wiped out, as Dole's brigade moved in on his flank, and so he made quick orders to the men of his brigade, and their commanders echoed their orders as the brigade moved to counter Dole's brigade. At the same time, the runner rushed to Barlow, who saw the advancing Georgians on his flank, and so he ordered a regiment of his brigade to wheel about to fire upon them. The large regiment again coiled around to face the new threat. With Ames brigade distracted, the 31st and Wright's Legion infantry continued around the left flank. They were supported by the 61st, who rushed into the fence behind the 153rd Pennsylvania, who at that moment focused their fire on the 60th. In response, the 26th turned to open fire on the large regiment as the 26th across the creek supported them. In the meantime, the Rice Legion infantry rushed across the bridge, seeing that the nearby Union forces were engaged, and so were only concerned with the stray bullets hitting the regiment. As soon as they left the bridge, the regiment turned to face the target as they moved into line. As the men vaulted the fence, the officer pointed his sword at the artillery battery. The rebels burst from the Three Line Creek with their yelping buzzle cannon and charged the guns. A skirmish company was caught up in their charge, but they were overwhelmed. The Rice Legion infantrymen fixed their bayonets on their hot blackened barrels if they had them. If not, they made ready their countless like bowie knives or rifle butts as crude clubs. The regiment advanced to the double, their rifles at their shoulder, forming its 13 companies into line, charging straight for the Federal artillery. Letting out a high-pitched yelping battle cry, the bugler and officers urging their men on. Come on, boys, come on! Their officer cried, pointing his saber towards the Federal gunners. The gunners frantically tried to reposition and load canister, or to spike the guns to make them useless to the attackers. Within 90 yards, the men broke into a howls as they charged the terrified gunners, easily overrunning the fifth gun of the battery. The terrified gunners quickly threw up their hands and surrendered, or fled. The regiment didn't falter as it lunged for the fourth gun and overran its crew as well. The nearby men of Ames Brigade were too slow to react, less so were the gunners who shot a spear of flame into the formation, unleashing a swarm of canister balls. The blast Pontius Mark, disemboweling a mass, riding the rank behind him with his innards. The gunners of the 4th gun were shown no mercy for their defiance, and all the gunners the regiment caught were ran through by the cold steel of the Rice Legion infantry. Then the commander spies Les Schwarzenegger are exposed and called on his men to charge into their rear. 
At the same time, the 17th Connecticut charged the 16th Georgia, and a vicious melee broke out between the two regiments. The men cut at each other with their blades in the trees, the vegetation adding to the confusion. A large member of the 17th Connecticut grabbed it and smashed a Georgian's head in a tree with a sickening crack. In the confusion, General Barlow rode out to Bonglisa on his way to rally the 17th Connecticut. When he arrived, Barlow warned Bonglisa of his imminent encirclement. The officer turned around, surprised, not hearing the melees through the explosions of powder, but it was too late. The men of the 17th Connecticut broke, followed shortly by a Schwartz Jaeger. The large regiment to his front, seeing their rear exposed, began to break down. They're all around us! We must leave at once! Bugler! Sounds of it! Here they come! This is our last chance! Or we'll all perish! Mind of cards! It's an entire brigade! We're being pushed back! Get back here, you coward! The two merchants broke and ran like fugitives. The men of the Schwarzenegger, the closest to the almost crazed Wright's Legion infantry, surrendered, fearing that they would be pursued and cut down. At the same time, the 17th Connecticut withdrew, pursued not by the howling Confederate units, but by the trumpeting commander, General Gordon. The nearby second gun of the nearby artillery battery burst violently, putting canister into the ranks of the Legion. One Legionnaire caught in the blast was torn in the hail of iron and looked on his spilled intestine and muttered almost inaudibly, Isn't that something? before passing out. The company that passed the closest to the withdrawing 153rd Pennsylvania, the Company C, Goshen Blues, charged a much larger formation. Von Gilsa, who was just behind them, heard them, and twisting in his saddle, ordered his men to charge the attackers, but they could not stand, and his regiment fell to pieces as well, racing to the rear. Just before the troops clashed, Von Gilsa rode his horse to the rear, knocking over several Confederate units en route, crushing them beneath the iron hooves. The right Legion infantry regrouped once again, their bayonets sticky with the blood of the Union soldiers. With many of the Union regiments pushed back from the creek, Gordon's brigade began to advance once again. This began with the 31st Georgia moving across the fence which was once held by the Dutch forces. This was continued by the 61st Georgia moving on the flank of the 75th Ohio. The Rice Legion infantry then wheeled about to admire their path of destruction in the wake of their regiment, before advancing once again on the battery of artillery on the knoll. The men of the 75th Ohio quickly responded, charging towards them, but they were easily pushed back after an intense fire they had been under from those brigade. The regiment quickly moved on the guns, who quickly surrendered, but the gunners were killed by the men of the regiment in revenge of killing so many of their comrades. The regiment then moved quickly to regroup under the withering deadly fire of the 25th Ohio behind the fences as best they could. The Rice Legion infantry were ordered to reform with the rest of their brigade by their officer, but the men refused, and the regiment about face and opened fire. Inspired by the Rice Legion infantry, the 60th, 61st, and 26th advanced beyond the tree line creek. As they advanced, the remnants of Ames Brigade held behind the fence as best they could as it was slowly torn to pieces by the balls of the advancing Confederate regiments. The men of the brigade lay on their bellies, attempting to avoid the Confederate fire. Their formation was only disturbed when a regiment of Dole's brigade moved to flank them. The 25th Ohio, in response, turned several companies until the formation formed an almost V-shape. At the same time to the rear, Hayes looked through his field glasses at the knoll, seeing that it was almost now clear Federal forces ordered his brigades of Louisiana's forward to the edge of Rock Creek. All the while, the troops of Gordon's brigade continued to flank the stubborn position of Ames' brigade. Gordon riding behind his men, trumpeting more encouragement and ordering his men forward. While the men in the 25th Ohio were pinned down in the crossfire, the 61st Georgia advanced, their bayoneted rifles at the shoulder like an iron fence, their officer pointing his saber forward with about 70 yards to go. They then broke out into the rebel yell, charging and leveling their bayoneted rifles like a phalanx. Ames on the wall stood nearby and ordered his men to stand. but they were quickly driven back by the charge of the 61st Georgia. However, in the maelstrom of melee, the officer's horse panics and runs behind our lines. The horse passes the advancing 13th Georgia, advancing towards the 5th German Regiment. All the while, the men of Hayes Brigade are nearly reaching their position.
The men of the 13th Georgia charged the troops of the 5th German Regiment, encountered by their bayoneted rifles, bowie knives, and haversacks. Many of the soldiers were only a few yards ago dropped their rifles to more easily fight with their bowie knives. However, it did not come to this, as many of the Ohioans lying on the ground behind the fence, seeing the wild Southerners charge, surrendered, not having time to get up to resist them. Others made a feeble attempt before being captured or killed. The rest of the regiment simply ran away, followed by Ames, who attempted to rally them. When the Confederates reached the retreating units, a sergeant ordered a man to drop his weapon and swore to tell another. Then the first made to shoot the sergeant, but he saw this, cleaving the man's head open with his sword. Then came a mighty shout from Gordon for his brigade to reform along the fence by the knoll. The men of the 13th quickly went to retrieve their rifles and to reform along the fence with the rest of their brigade. At the same time, the men of Hayes' brigade were urged on by their commander as they advanced to the peaceful creek. Just to the left of Hayes' brigade, Avery's brigade was also ordered to, to the bridge to support the right flank. And to their left, Smith's brigade was ordered to support the other flank. Both brigades advancing in column by company. At the same time, Johnson limbered one of his batteries and ordered them to the knoll. By this time, the last of Gordon's brigade's regiments had formed up on the fences, except for the 31st, who waited a few hundred paces behind. As they rested, the men looked on the scene to their front, where Dole's brigade's regiment reformed to pursue the remnants of Barlow's division toward the county almshouse. At this time, Hayes' brigade waded through the Hellish Creek. The water was now stained red as blood flowed into the creek from the bodies along the banks. Flies began to descend, laying eggs in the flesh of bodies or parts of bodies, many of the soldiers stopping to vomit at the sight, only holding up the advance and only adding to the vile surroundings. Dole's brigade advanced on Barrow's division as Hayes' brigade emerges from the hell which is Rock Creek. He orders his men to form a battle line on Dole's position as the men of his brigade march to the remains of the gory ground around the knoll. Seeing that the field was clear of federal forces, Hay sends couriers to Avery and Smith to advance past the creek. The couriers gallop across the field, trampling the corpses beneath their hooves, now red with the gore of the dead of both sides. Around this time, Dole's brigade forms into line and advances on the rallied troops of Brawler's division by the county of Elm's house. In the meantime, the two brigades across the creek are halfway to their destination. Hay thanks Gordon for clearing the knoll, then advances with his brigade to support Dole's brigade. But the 31st Georgia gets in the way of his regiments, and Gordon rides down the line to personally order them to move back. Trying to waste as little time as possible, the men of Hayes' brigade move out the double through the new gap in the line to attack the federal forces. All the while, stray bullets fizz through the air. As the brigade advances, Dole's brigade advances through the gun smoke and unleashes a volley of smoke and flame on the remainder of Barlow's division. 
The first rank disappearing in a sulfur-laden powder smoke, their faces wild with fear, anger, and twisted excitement. Show those boys why we're the best in the entire army. Let's load up and do some shooting. Y'all do real good, boys. Look at the bro. That drummer boy called out to his mother as he made a feeble attempt to stop his guts from spilling out. An officer looked in disbelief at the spreading blood in his lap from a bullet wound in his groin. A corporal vomited blood and collapsed. A ball thumped into his chest like a hammer blow adding a fresh layer of bodies and blood to the slick grass around the Alms House. Small smoldering fires in the grass were started by burning walls from the paper cartridges, only helping to add to the unbearable heat. Hay moved his brigade forward in the open train, directing his marching columns with his gleaming sword in his outstretched arm. The men approached the boiling smoke that surrounded the county almshouse where Barlow and Dole's men were engaged in a desperate firefight, the stray bullets whipping hard overhead. However, from where Hay sat on his horse, it appeared that only one brave regiment held back the horde of Dutch Yankees. Falling behind them was a large amount of exhausted and ashamed prisoners, with their heads held low and shuffling, staggering or limping, among them an aggravated General Ames. Seeing the clump of regiment, Hay orders his brigade to attack and push them across the next creek. Now that Hay's brigade had long passed, the 31st Georgia moved onto the fence once again, their officer making sure to look to the creek to make sure no more brigades were coming, not wanting to gain more of Gordon's ire. The officer saw the men of Avery's brigade passing the bridge wide of the rest of the division. At the same time, one of the Louisiana regiments advanced to flank the Federals by the almshouse. The men of Avery's brigade crossed the bridge farther up the creek, so they were spared the horrors that the men of Hayes' brigade had experienced further down. Avery directed his men to the two houses up the road from the county almshouse. At the same time, Hayes' brigade formed into battle line just behind the forces of Doles, all except the 8th Louisiana, who were under heavy shell fire from the nearby artillery battery. Shells sounded like ripping cloths as they smoked through the sky until one cracked apart in black smoke and stabs of red flame among the regiment's ranks. A sergeant crashed sent this up where his arm once was. A corporal vomited blood before collapsing, and another shell landed nearby, throwing up chunks of earth, showering the nearby men with dirt. The bugler ordered the regiment to wheel right to the move out the double to the battery. The leftmost company vaulted the fence as they advanced. At the same time, the men of Doles and Hayes' brigade fired on the Federals at the Alms House. Solid shot flew through the leftmost companies, hitting a man whose blood flew ten feet in the air, followed by his severed leg spinning wildly. The men filled the gaps as the men continued forward at the double, as another shell burst like a pale firework overhead. Then another causing a jarring seismic thump, throwing up chunks of earth, rending the rear ranks with clods of earth. Then crossing the road, iron fragments from the smoking flames spread in all directions, piercing one man's skull who immediately fell to the ground. Another convulsed and screamed as they hit his thigh. This did not deter the Louisianans, who continued on, leaping and hauling, then lowering their bayonets, charging the fourth gun of the battery. Gun two, farther back, belched a belly of canister into their ranks, flailing many. The men reached the guns, and the gunners surrendered. The men charged the next gun, but it managed to deliver an escape, and the other guns as well. Troops advanced on the fence in pursuit, then breaking into a charge, but the cannons managed to escape. The battery commander was less lucky and was captured, but the battery was dispersed and the Louisianans were recalled to Hay to the almshouse. The guns fired shots in response, taking off the legs of two more men who screamed and writhed on the ground. Another attempted to crawl to the fences before collapsing. At the almshouse, one of Dole's regiments advanced on the 5th German Regiment as the 75th fleet across a creek.
Seeing that his regiments were well rested, Gordon sent a courier to Avery to hold the knoll, and he advanced his brigade to the Newville Road to attack the Union flank and to support Rhodes' attack. His brigade then, with bugles crying and sergeants yelling hoarsely to their men to keep their lines straight, advanced. Dole's brigade now surrounded the remnants around the Alms House. The crashing musketry scars the surrounding trees and buildings with bullet marks. Hay rode up hurling insults to the Union line, cursing their mothers, children, and past and short futures before riding back to his line. The air around the Alms House was surrounded by a fog-like smoke and the ground surrounding it covered in bodies and blood slick and scorched ground. Then something caught the attention of the men in the Alms House. The skirmishers on the top floor looked and shot out from it. They had been led into a trap, as two fresh regiments came from the other side of the Alms House. As a runner arrived and explained what the men of the 5th Louisiana saw, Hay reacted quickly, ordering a nearby bugler to order his brigade to reform behind that of Dole's brigade. The bugle blared and a ball pierced the instrument in the man's hand. At the same time, Gordon's brigade passed by, stray bullets whistling overhead as the men attempted to step around the mutilated corpses that lined the ground. The Pelican Regiment was the first to respond, not having been deployed in the fight at the Alms House. Hay ordered them to face the northwest corner of the Alms House. Then Hay shouts an order to the Louisiana Tigers, ordering them to support the Pelicans. As the regiment began to move out, a burst of shrapnel exploded overhead. In the turmoil of hot iron fragments and smoke raining among the regiment, an officer fell, his shoulder soaked in blood, and an enlisted man fell near him, weeping for his mother as his severed arm was held in his hand. Looking through his field glasses, Avery saw the flanking action and ordered his brigade forward after sending a courier to Smith to take position on the knoll. The 60th Georgia mistook the bugle call for their own orders in the turmoil of battle, but they passed the other regiments of their brigade as they moved to the Newville Road. With most of the federal troops as the Alms House were breaking, Hayes felt confident enough to withdraw his brigade to fight the Viking forces. The Pelican Regiment, in the meantime, doubled the fence to stop the first of the Viking Regiments, the second Hecker Regiment. In the meantime, Gordon's Brigade advanced on the batteries at Shelby 8th Louisiana, all the while under the same heavy fire. The 8th Louisiana, at the same time, were a few hundred yards away, pinned by that same artillery fire. Then Gordon moved out a few hundred yards in front and ordered his brigade to advance on the artillery. Some of the regiments had lied down except for their color party and officers, who bravely stood, oblivious of the shells screaming in the air, making small talk, boasting how well their regiments are doing while smoking cigars. The brigade then advanced, some forming column, while others reluctantly yelling to their companies to pick themselves off the ground. On the other side of the field, another regiment moved to attack the Confederate flank, However, this mattered little, as the entirety of Avery's large brigade of North Carolinians began to form a battle line nearby and advance on them through the fields near the Harrisburg Road, linking them to the rest of Hayes' brigade. Dole's brigade also moved in to attack the flanking Federal forces, complicating matters and entangling the two brigades.
While this counterattack occurs, Gordon's brigade advances through the fields to release in the 8th Louisiana, who moved to the bridge to push back the last of Ames' brigade. While Dole continues his advance on their flanking forces, Smith moves behind the bridge that the 8th Louisiana moved to. One of Dole's regiments charged the 2nd Hecker Regiment, who took pot shots from behind the fence of the Louisiana Tigers marching up in support. As they got there, the Federals withdrew, so they charged the next regiment, the 61st Ohio, just in front of the Elms House. But just as the regiment broke into a charge, the brave men of the 5th Louisiana, after holding off three regiments of Federal forces, then tried to advance across the field to make it to the rear, but one crash of rifle fire pushed them back. We held them as long as we could. It only took Claire catching one for the bastards to swarm in the building and... Ah, we were caught like tigers in the pit. Keep still now. Motion excites the gangrene. The charge of the Louisiana Tigers have now become a horrifying melee as rifle butts broke skulls and bayonets and bullet knives sliced into guts. And the wounded screamed and writhed in agony on the floor, tripping up soldiers, forcing them into deadly grappling matches. In the meantime, Avery's brigade moved to counter the flanking attack, moving through the fields by the Harrisburg Road. The Louisiana Tigers, after breaking the 2nd Hecker Regiment, moved in to replace the 13th Georgia. The regiment entered the house, still smelling of acrid gunpowder, and the walls scorched with close firing, and the walls cut and dented by the hand-to-hand -hand combat. The two federal regiments that crossed the creek now broke into a chaotic mob, leaving only one of the original regiments of their brigade to cover their retreat. The final federal regiment took up position in the orchard, taking murderous fire from the nearby Confederate regiments. This is where the regiment took its stand. Sparks from the exploding percussion caps filled the air with smoke, burning the faces of the men. The officer encouraged his men, Think of the future of our perfect union! His speech was cut short as the bullet hit him, and he fell, letting out a succession of screams all writhing in the grass. Another man nearby reeled back, his shoulder was soaked in blood, while an untrained man had a musket barrel explode from continual loading without firing, killing several around him with the iron fragments. The Federals moved to attack the left flank once again with fresh troops of Krasnowski's brigade. The Louisiana Tigers crowd some of their companies in the almshouse was now charged by two regiments of Federal troops, so the rest of the regiment fell back, leaving Company D, Carruthers sharpshooters, to their fate. The Polish Legion and the 1st German Regiment charged them. Seeing their comrades withdraw, the Bloody Six moved in to complete the semicircle around the almshouse, but at the, in doing this, they trapped the 9th Louisiana as the 1st German Legion pursued them. Then suddenly, with a great shout, the regiment turned on the Pennsylvanians, and a chaotic melee ensued, in which the Company G charged out of the house and charged into the backs of the Pennsylvanians. At this time, the Federals brought up two more regiments to the Confederate left flank, and on the right began to regroup on the other side of Rock Creek. Seeing the threat on the flank, Avery sends the 21st North Carolina to stop them. At the same time, Dole sends one of his regiments to do the same. In the center, the men of the Louisiana Tigers encounters two more regiments, and a plan goes into action. As the bugle of the Nine sounds the retreat, and the regiment ran to the side or threw themselves to the ground, as a semicircle of flame was unleashed on the advancing Yankees. Say run, men! Forward! whipped all around us and we took cover as best we could in the crops behind the arms house. However, our uniforms revealed us to the rebels. Whole companies fell in moments holding up our colors. There was no escape. The men of the 82nd Ohio was blasted from all directions and were forced to lay on the ground. 
Smith's brigade, in the meantime, finally arrived by the bridge by the Harrisburg Road, but as the final regiment got into place, Gordon sent a courier to Smith, ordering the men of his brigade to attack the artillery to his front, as the men of his brigade were too tired to go on, and so he moved to guard the bridge. The two brigades moved into position, all the while Gordon's brigade was under a heavy artillery fire. The shells landed all around them as hot iron frags were ripped off limbs or teared into bodies as Gordon's brigade crossed the field, trampled and soaked with blood. One man was lucky and only took a piece of shrapnel to the knee and managed to limp his way, more or less, to the rear. Another was less so, nearly decapitated with his brains exposed, vomiting blood before quickly collapsing. Smith's brigade was then ordered to the Newville Road and into battle line behind the fences before being ordered forward. The men of Krasnowski's brigade by the almshouse were then surrounded in a semicircle from Dole, Avery, and Hayes brigades, giving them little chance to escape as they could barely move in the cone of fire. The officer of the Louisiana Tiger, seeing that they were now clear of the line of fire on both sides, ordered his bugle to sound the recall, but his men were caught up in the withdrawal and began to retreat. Avery, cursing the retreating Louisianans, ordered the 21st North Carolina into column to move around the flank of the Federals on the left flank. At the same time, Hay had a similar thought about the Tigers and so sent the Pelican Regiment to an opening between the regiments. As this occurred, the men of Gordon and Smith's brigade switched places. The men of Gordon's brigade, while the advance, were blasted with canister and shells, the men suffering greatly, ears ringing from the nearby cannon. A shell exploded under a mounted officer, throwing him from his mount and covering him in, the, in his blood and viscera. One man carried his bloody remains of his arms after he was torn from his body by canister fire. This became too much for the men of the 26th Georgian, who charged the cannon against the orders of Gordon. Their officer screaming hoarse encouragements to his men as they charged through the boiling smoke, pointing his bloody and dirty saber through it. The gunners unleashed a blast of canister, which made several of the men of Company C, the Seaboard Guard, into what looked like what would belong in a butcher's slab. All the while, the nearby Federal Re Division Commander Schultz looked on horrified at the loss of his division as the regiment crossed the field towards the battery. Eventually, the bugle called the charge. The men broke out into blood-curdling screams as they rushed the guns. The Georgians even easily overwhelmed the gunners of the first gun, capturing many of the men and the gun. Then the 26th Georgia rushed the fence, but the gunners managed to escape with their gun before the screaming blade cloud attackers could reach them. Then something else caught their eyes. Drive those yellow bastards back! Those bastards are bringing up another brigade! We're drawing too much attention! Well, charging them isn't very subtle, is it? After the scare of the new brigade, the 26th Georgia continues their charge across the fence. The day was hot and the air was filled with powder so that the mouths and gulls of the men were dry and raw. Leaving their yells horses, the men panted as they continued to run. The gunners managed to haul their guns away, making the battery scattered like a flock of frightened birds. As a federal courier attempted to navigate the smoke and chaos that surrounded the battlefield, the iron horseshoes of his mount crushing the dead and wounded beneath him, but in doing so, he stumbled upon the Confederate line. At the same time, three of Gordon's regiments had reached the road to the Newville Bridge, and another stops the form line to engage a fresh federal unit who moved up to forming line to stop them. Seeing this, the 13th and 31st Georgia were deployed to meet the regiment at the bridge. Around the almshouse, more and more regiments withdrew across the creek, leaving only one regiment in the orchard. One in front of the almshouse, with some companies in the buildings, and two on our left flank. In response to this, the 21st North Carolina deployed to attack those on the left. The long column of North Carolinians moved to flank the two federal regiments. The 119th New York moved into the same position as the 1st German regiment that earlier broke from the withering fire, and then it was subject to the same fire. All the while, an officer attempted to rally them, but after a short period of time, his horse was hit, pumping up seen amount of bright blood before collapsing. In the meantime, Smith's brigade had formed along the Newville Road and was sent a courier to, ordering them to advance to relieve the 26th Georgia and push back the cannon. The Georgians, in the meantime, opened fire on the cannons, their arms aching from the constant ramming of their guns, the bullets cracking and pinging against the limbers and guns as the gunners threw themselves to the ground or out of their pieces, taking cover as best they could. The Smith's Brigade continued their advance to support Rhodes' attack. All hell was breaking loose in the Elms House as the 119th New York broke and streamed amongst its buildings, the men tripping over their dead bodies and slipping on the blood of slick ground. All the while, the Polish Legion attempted to cover their retreat from the nearby fence, but their fire had little effect as their rifles were at maximum range. The suffocating powder smoke hung, caught under the branches of the trees as the Irish rifles came through the smoke, screaming like banshees, their long wicked bayonets and large bow knives in hand. Their charge was covered by the 4th Georgia as bulls buzzed by them like angry hornets.
We began to back as long as we could. Many of the other regiments were retreating across the creek as we made our stand. By this point, we were almost out of ammunition. Our shoulders bruised black with the recoil of our heavy guns. Our rifles fouled by color so that every shot required a great amount of effort to ram the charges home. When we screamed and fought, we prayed and fought. The gun smoke around us cloaked the surrounding horse swine. Then we heard them charge. On the far side of the Harrisburg Road, the 119th New York desperately held the line on the wooden fence as the 57th and 21st North Carolina opened fire upon them. The men lie on the ground as they took shots with their rifles, but after a volley from the North Carolinas forced their heads down, the 21st North Carolina moved onto their flank. In the center of the line, the 6th North Carolina advanced on the trampled bloody fields in front of the county almshouse. As they halted, they came upon a huge pile of bodies from the men of both sides, all mingled together in and around the almshouse. As they halted, a great show came from the orchard as the Irish Rifles contacted the Seagal's regiment. As the two regiments collided, the commander of the Seagal regiment yelled encouraging words in their own language to the nearby regiment. Their fierce melee continued as the 8th Louisiana fired on the withdrawing federal troops. Many balls splashed around the men as they chaotically pushed their way through the waist-high water, drowning in the process. As they got to the other side, their wet woolen uniforms slowed them down to be easily cut down by the accurate rifle fire. In the meantime, Smith's brigade received a courier from Old Jubilee to support the 26th Georgia to attack the artillery, then to move on to its support roads. Dexter Smith was hesitant to leave the rest of the division behind. So the 26th Georgia, in the meantime, crossed the fence and continued to charge the artillery, who scattered and ran. Tells exploded all around them as they charged. Then a cannon blasted a hole in the fence, throwing deadly splinters in the faces of two men who writhed in agonizing pain. The regiment continued their charge, the colors flying proudly in the breeze as gunners attempted to load their pieces but were too shaken by the charge, dropping vital fuses and scrambling for them on the ground. As the regiment broke into a screaming charge, the gunners fled for their lives with a wild cry of the grey cloud attackers. The Georgians had nothing to spite the cannon, so abandoned them when they withdrew to join the rest of Gordon's brigade. The men of Smith's brigade were sent to relieve the men of the 26th Georgia and to support Rhodes' attack. In the meantime, the men of Hayes and Gordon's brigade reorganized as they planned to cross the creek. Avery's men in the meantime pushed back the final, last stubborn regiments on the left side. Those men held as best they could, but their formation began to edge back as many of them began to desert and tried to run for the rear. One of the deserters looked back and was hit in the jaw with a bullet, and blood and spill poured from it as he clutched it and staggered to the rear. An officer grimaced at the sight, but continued to rally the 119th New York, telling them to hold the line while keeping his head down. One of his encouraging speeches was drowned out when a great scream came from the 21st North Carolina as they surged forth with knives and bayonets in hand with twisted grins on their faces. Hay, in the meantime, ordered his forces across the creek to flank the defenders. Now that the whole division began to move, Smith finally responds to his orders and moves to support Rhodes.
As Avery's brigade pushes forward, they trap the 74th Pennsylvania between three of the large North Carolina regiments. The men kept their heads down as splinters flew all around them as well as bullets. Other men bravely pop up to fire into the thickening haze of gunpowder as they talk to each other in hoarse voices. Christ, that was close. No use ducking your hand. The bullets are already behind you when you hear them. Someone, spare me a cartridge! My gun is all choked up. A horde of couriers is sent back and forth, followed by the calls from bugles as Gordon and Dole's brigades reorganize around the almshouse as they prepare to cross the creek. As the brigade reorganizes, a soldier passes a courier sitting by his dead horse, his face muddy and blackened by powder, sitting in a puddle of his horse's blood. He stared off into space, ignoring the enemies around him. A soldier walked up and plucked the bloody message from his hand as the man didn't even notice. Written on the bloody page was a request for support. As the rest of the brigade reforms, Gordon looks through his field glasses and saw that the federal forces had begun to regroup as well, and so he ordered his brigade along the Newville Road. As the firefight on the left continues, the 6th and 21st North Carolina advance on the position, constricting around the 75th Pennsylvania, taunting shouts of, Hey crowd, this one's for you! Might as well keep your heads down, Yanks! Keep up now while you still can! And opening a devastating volley, at the same time the regiment drawing nearer and nearer, firing and pointing their menacing bayonets forward. At the same time, the 6th Louisiana, now that the chaos around the almshouse has settled, had rejoined the rest of Hayes' brigade on the other side of the creek. Also seeing that Smith's brigade had come to relieve them, the 61st Georgia also rejoined their brigade. The Irish rifles, absolutely exhausted from their retreat to the rear, finally moved back to the almshouse in a ragged column with a long line of stragglers. Even while the combat around the almshouse had ended, they halted and regrouped. As the North Carolina regiments closed on the 74th Pennsylvania, the 6th North Carolina summoned the energy to taunt the Germans with a rebel yell, but were too tired to charge. However, it drew the attention away from the 21st, who continued to advance. On the other side of the Newville Road, Smith's brigade had finally arrived a few hundred yards from the Yankees that stopped Rose's attack. For a moment, a round of solid shot ripped through the ranks of one of the nearby regiments, and the rear disappeared in a red cloud. Smith then ordered his brigade of Virginians forward, fresh and eager for, to the fight since they had not yet engaged. To the south of them, two Georgian regiments had made a chaotic charge on the men of the Warren Rifles of the First Corps. not soldiers. See how those damn farm boys run when they fight real soldiers. Let's give them a volley so they don't come back. As the Georgians were pushed back by the Warren rifles, the nearby artillery blasted their ranks with canister. In the meantime, Gordon's brigade advanced on the reforming troops by the campus of the Gettysburg College. Hayes' brigade formed to the south of them, making the Confederate line nearly from Rock Creek to the northern outskirts of the town of Gettysburg. As Smith's brigade advanced, they were noticed by one of the regiments that turned around. 
Smith sent his brigade forward with him at his head, pointing his saber forward and yelling to his men, Forward, men of old Virginia! His men rushed forward to the fence as the 134th New York turned to open fire upon them. At the same time, extra Billy Smith's boys moved forward to fire on the rear of the 73rd Pennsylvania. In the meantime, the troops of Rose Division had taken heavy losses, their colors had been shot to rags, and the code of fire that the Federals had formed. A supply wagon bravely went to the troops who began to lose cohesion in the center. Farther to the south, Gordon and Hayes Brigade engaged two regiments of the Reform Brigade's troops as they took cover as best they could in the wheat field along the Newville Road. The regiment losing cohesion in the field as men got turned around in the smoking chaos, some men taking advantage of this to desert, causing the regiment to lose more cohesion. As another regiment streamed past, Barlow was near to mental breakdown, screaming how he hated the beery and impenetrable Germans. Further to the north, the men of Avery's Brigade continued to move to the town of Gettysburg to hold the flank of the long Confederate line and the roads that went north through the town. To the rear of the line, two Georgian regiments continued to retreat, no doubt to tell them early that the first corps may be into counterattack in hopes of avoiding being court-martialed for retreating. As Dole, Gordon, and Hayes' brigade attack the Reform Brigade, it quickly descends into chaos as the troops retreated through our line. Officers of our regiment allowed them to go through to sow more chaos among them. This evidently began to work as two regiments holding the brigade in the wheat field broke at the same time. Encouraged by this, Confederate brigade commanders ordered their lines forward, their orders emphasized by the buglers. As Gordon's brigade got closer, the nearby battery fire became more perilous as shells forced one of his regiments to lay on their bellies, staining their uniform fronts with blood, before the great general ordered them forward. To the right of the Confederate line, Smith's brigade's attack was seeing food as his old regiment broke the 73rd Pennsylvania and moved into the flank of the hardtack regiment. Then Smith called for a general advance, but this was mostly ignored as his men were already engaged. But as extra Billy Smith's boys moved in on the flank of the 134th New York, they began to lose cohesion once again. On the left flank, Hay orders his brigade to attack beyond the Newville Road, but his brigade was tangled up. Gordon's troops in the center were more orderly, but exhausted, and refused to leave the battle line. However, their forces were soon attacked by units through the field and bombarded by the nearby artillery. As Avery's brigade advances to the Gettysburg College, they encounter a regiment streaming from the town, but as soon as this new federal regiment sees them, they withdraw immediately. As more troops approached Hayes Brigade, the men of the Pelican Regiment moved to support them. The line was making good progress, but the farther the line advanced, the more of a gap formed in the center of the line. The attack of Smith's Brigade, however, had relieved the forces of Rose Division, giving them a good chance to reorganize and surround the regiments on the left flank. The Federal regiments quickly lose cohesion as bulls whistle in all directions and wet thuds followed by screams and curses, denoting if they found their mark. As Avery's Brigade deployed in double line by the college to respond to the flanking maneuver by the Reform Brigade, keeping one of their regiments in reserve to respond to regiments flanking through the town. The line despite being under constant attack was holding steadily as both sides were exhausted.
A Federal regiment moved to explore the large Galpera line by moving around the flank of Smith's brigade. Seeing this, however, the 52nd Virginia rushed to a nearby fence to halt their advance, but was shelled, losing a great many men from the Company A Augusta Fencibles when a shell exploded among their ranks. Smith, seeing that the two regiments were about to break, charged the 52nd Virginia forward to break the two regiments. However, seeing this, the officer of the 134th managed to reorganize his men and the 52nd Virginia halted. At that very moment, a regiment of Rose Brigade charged the two regiments along the worm fence. This left the 134th New York exposed and nearly surrounded as the 31st Virginia advanced on their flank. The 26th Georgia was pinned down by the artillery battery as men lay flat, concealed by the weed in the muddy field, praying for deliverance as shells screamed overhead. This came when a regiment guarding the battery moved to flank Smith's brigade and was broken. The men hesitantly got to their feet, raised up their blood red flag and rushed the battery, crushing the wheat in their way as shells screeped overhead and crashed into the other regiments of Gordon's brigade. Gordon then ordered the his brigade along the Mummersburg Road as and Hay followed suit. By now, the 26th Georgia had arrived at the fence and vaulted over it, moving towards the artillery, who at the time was being supplied by an ammunition wagon. As the regiment approached, the ammunition wagon smashed through the fence and escaped. Then the Georgians charged gun through the battery, frightening the battery commander's horse who fled and overwhelming the gunners, capturing the gun. But the regiment became disorganized and the other guns lingered and escaped. To the south, the men of Dole's brigade once again blocked the attack of Gordon's brigade. As our line continued to advance, another Yankee courier was captured, revealing a message for support. The 49th Virginia rushes forward once again, and this was too much for the 134th New York, who retreated despite the nearby officer. The final Federal Regiment broken in his path, Smith orders an attack on Oak Ridge. Farther to the south, the reorganized brigade began a mostly organized withdrawal as Gordon and Hayes' brigade pursued them. The troops in the rear finally reorganized and moved on Gettysburg. The Irish rifles spot shirts and move on him to capture him to redeem their early withdrawal. As the majority of the 11th Corps rushes to the rear like a great migration, Avery's brigade moves to fight the reorganized brigade. On the outskirts of Gettysburg, General Barlow angrily mumbled under his breath while scribbling a dispatch before throwing it to the ground. The constant pushing of the line was too much for the 4th Georgia, who was absolutely exhausted. They broke and retreated to the rear, but not running. They simply walked back, looking for water. However, the line continued to advance and pushed the Reform Brigade back.
The 26th Georgia, in the meantime, charged gun one and captured it as shells exploded overhead, raining hot iron from the sky. The 26th Georgia attempted to continue the charge, climbing the fence, but blasts of canister took out half the company as they climbed the fence. Despite this, the regiment persisted and charged gun 2, then gun 5, capturing both of them before the gunners could limit their pieces. The gunners were killed if they did not flee after causing so many casualties to the Confederates. After that, the rest of the 26th were recalled back to the rest of the division. By the college, the men of Avery's Brigade moved in on the flank of the Reform Brigade. This advance was followed by Gordon and Hayes' Brigade, who quickly broke the last of the Reform Brigade, leading to victory. Early's assault goes well, sir. Excellent. Excellent. We shall easily sweep aside those Yankees, and I shall ride to Rowton Hills for them to see if their attacks go well as well. Be safe, Colonel. Stay on the York Road, and you'll surely stay behind our lines. Now to check on Jasper. Sometime later.
Judging by the gauge, it's not showing any fluctuations in the time stream. He hasn't completed his mission yet. The lazy git. Or he has failed, and he's coming to kill me. Well, there's only one way to find out.